right, folks, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered for Friday, April 5th, 2019. Chicago, they still plan to sue Jesse Smollett to recover money they say he spent on what they say were false claims of hate-motivated attacks. The new incoming mayor, she said he must be held into account. Really? Out of all the drama in Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, that's your first priority? Y'all, check this out. Police in and around Chicago, they want Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox to resign, they say, because of how she handled the Jesse Smollett case. All these police chiefs ain't said a damn thing about police misconduct. They ain't say jack about lying cops on a witness stand. They haven't said jack about cops who have beaten people. But y'all feel extra about Jesse Smollett. Yeah, I'm going to light that ass up in a minute. The man accused of killing Nipsey Hussle is a famous lawyer, Christopher Darden, one of the prosecutors of O.J. Simpson. He's catching all kind of heat on social media. Bill Cosby's insurance company has settled seven uh, defamation lawsuits against him. Cosby says, not my money, wasn't my choice. Also, Beyonce, she told Reebok, holla at y'all later. No people look like me. I ain't doing business with y'all. She signs with Adidas. Oh, I just love it when my girl from H-Town show them how we roll. And also, you know how some white folks say we should pull ourselves up by our bootstrap just like they did, and they always talk about what Dr. King would do if he was alive? Well, mm, I, wait till I'm going to deconstruct y'all, Laura Ingram, what she had to say and invoke the name of Dr. King on the 51st anniversary of his death. Laura, I'm about to take your Ivy League graduating ass to school. Yeah, you know it's going to be fun. We'll finish the show tonight with more remembrances of April 4th, 1968, the icons of the Civil Rights Movement, such as Bill Lucy, Juanita Abernathy, the widow of Ralph Abernathy, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Andrew Young, James Lawson, Dorothy Cotton, Claiborne Carson, and Martin Luther King III. Oh, yeah, it's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. It's on go, go, roll, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. 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 Rolling with rolling now. Yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. y'all, Chicago, they say they're going to sue Empire actor Jesse Smollett, saying that he cost the city of Chicago $130,000 because of all that time Chicago cops spent investigating he case, his case that they, that they say was a host. hoax. His lawyer, Mark Garrigo, said if the city followed through on its threat, he will depose Mayor Rahm Emanuel and police superintendent Eddie Johnson. Incoming Mayor Lori Lightfoot was asked uh, the day after she won. She said Smollett must be held accountable. Now you got a group of suburban police chiefs who joined with the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police to give Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox a vote of no confidence. Really? That's, that's what y'all did? Fraternal Order Police President Kevin Graham stood with some 30 suburban police leaders and called on Fox to resign. Of course, Cook County encompasses Chicago and a number of other suburban towns. Now, this is what I find to be real interesting, y'all. 30 chiefs come together to say Kim Fox needs to quit. I have spent time today looking on social media for any evidence of those same chiefs coming together and condemning Chicago having to pay more than $700 million since 2004 for police misconduct cases. I haven't found one statement. In fact, I 
was looking for a statement from the Chicago Fraternal Order Police and these 30 police chiefs when a judge in Chicago busted several cops who knowingly, willingly, and unabashedly sat on the witness stand and lied in his courtroom, sent those claims to the police review board and said they got to be investigated. I do not recall a single statement from any of these police chiefs. In fact, uh, Dante Servin was a cop who was off duty, who saw some black folks talking and arguing. He interceded Escalated the situation, pull his gun out, shot Rakia Boyd in the head, kills her. The former uh, state's attorney charges him. They go to court. Judge says, gave the wrong charge. He walked free. I do not recall any of these police chiefs saying a word. In fact, when the Department of Justice came into Chicago and interviewed cops and cops admitted calling suspects nigger and cops admitted dropping off gang members in rival gang territory, I do not recall any of these chiefs or the Fraternal Order Police saying a damn thing. In fact, when it was discovered that Chicago had their own Guantanamo Bay <laughs> on Holman Street, right. where they had a facility where they would take people who were arrested and they would not enter the information into the police system. So when the lawyers, when the family would hire a lawyer and the lawyer would go to the police department and say, where's so-and-so, they would say, we don't know what you're talking about because they had no record of them in the system. Because they were being held at the Holman Street location. I do not recall these 30 police chiefs holding a news conference. And the last point, the city of Chicago had to pay more than $40 million in reparations to black men who were beaten and abused, who went to prison, some were on death row because former Lieutenant, former Commander John Burge used Vietnam War era tactics torture tactics against them, beating them with uh, phone books, attaching uh, batteries and cables to their genitals and shocking them, cost the city millions to defend him. I don't recall any of these chiefs coming together and condemning John Burge. But Jesse got y'all so hot and bothered that y'all literally want Kim Fox to step down and resign. Let's just be real clear. We know exactly what's going on right now. Joining us, joining us is Cheryl Dorsey, a retired LAPD sergeant and a member of the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers for Justice. Uh, and she's also the author uh, of a book. I'll have it in a second. Sh Cheryl, uh, to say I'm pissed at these trifling ass cops for doing what they're doing. They say nothing about any of that. But this black woman got these folks just upset because of Jesse. Well, you know, I trademarked a term that I normally use when there's a use of deadly force, and I call it contempt of cop. And by contempt of cop, what I mean is if you piss one off, there's a price to pay. Usually it ends up in deadly force, right? Like Eric Garner, he pissed him off, they choked him to death. Like Mike Brown, you know, he didn't get out of the street, they shot and killed him. And so now they're butthurt in Chicago. They are pissed off <laughs> with Jesse about this whole situation. And so they are not letting this stuff go. They are going to ride this thing until the wheels fall off. It would be nice to see that kind of excitement and enthusiasm behind everything that went on around the Laquan McDonald shooting and all of the officers who were co-conspirators, if you will, in uh, 
falsifying what happened that night, and they went to court, and they were all found not guilty. They um, misused and abused the female officer who spoke truthfully about what those officers were engaged in. And so you don't see that appetite. And listen, police chiefs do what police chiefs do. Their job and their obligation is to protect that entity, that organization. And so that's what they're doing. They're circling the wagons, and they're protecting the organization. And what was interesting here is that, again, we, we're talking about a case that, let's just be honest, if it had actually gone to trial, he wasn't going to jail. He wasn't going to go to jail. Um, and so, so they are making this mountain out of a molehill. And what do you make of the incoming black uh, female mayor who says he has to uh, pay for this, uh, it's, it's justice, and you're going, really, Lori Lightfoot? You got a pension problem? You got an education problem? You got a police misconduct problem? Uh, you got all kinds of problems, and you really trying to take your stand on Jesse. Well, you know, I think there's a symbiotic relationship amongst all those people involved. The mayor, you know, understand that generally police chiefs serve at the pleasure of the mayor. I'm not sure if in Chicago the commissioner, uh, the he superintendent does. serves at the pleasure he, he of the does. mayor. But they're all in concert. They're all in mm -hmm. bed together. They all speak the same code yep. talk. And so why they would want to die on this hill is beyond me. Well, I mean, you know why, because, you know, Jesse looks like me, right? If he uh, looked uh, like, you know, somebody else, then I don't think that they would have the same angst about, like you said, he's not going to go to jail. He's not a criminal. He's not likely to offend again. Um, this would not be anything unlike what would be done for someone who doesn't look like me behind the scenes. They'd work out a deal, and then you'd be on your way. But because they are butthurt, because he had the temerity to not go along to get along, then they're going to fix him. This is about punishment, the same kind of punishment we see police officers met out to black folks who don't comply. Well, I, I just think it's, it's interesting to listen to these uh, these chiefs uh, again hold their conference and 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 uh, so public. And the fact that uh, thirty of them would do this shows the level of ignorance that you see that you're seeing there. Uh, and you're right; they said nothing when Rahm Emanuel held that Laquan McDonald tape for thirteen months. They have said nothing when cops have literally lied on reports and on the witness stand as well. And that's why I discount all of them because they're utterly, utterly irrelevant. Cheryl, your last comment. Well, you know, I say that problems that go on on police departments are institutional, they're systemic, and they're top down. And we have evidence of 30 police chiefs who think the way that they do. And so it explains exactly why police officers think and act the way that they do. All right, folks, Cheryl Dor Dorsey, again, retired uh, LAPD uh, sergeant member of the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers and Justice. And Cheryl, give folks your book. I couldn't really hear all of what you said, but your I book. think if you're asking me about my book, it's called Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate, and it's available on my website, www.sgtsherildorsey.com. All right, Cheryl, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. All right, I'm going to introduce my panel now, Barbara Arnwine. She's the founder of the Transformative Justice Coalition. Also, Eugene Craig, CEO, Eugene Craig Organization. Teresa Lundy, founder of TML Communications. Uh, and the, 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 Cheryl said the cops, they butt hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Big time. You know, it's, and it's not just Chicago, right? It's, it's also Suffolk County. Uh, Boston, you know, Massachusetts, where they filed a petition to the Supreme Court, of the Supreme Judicial Council of Massachusetts to have this newly elected prosecutor disbarred because she said she wasn't going to pursue all these stupid misdemeanor crimes. She wasn't going to keep incarcerating people. So they filed a a complaint to disbar her. Isn't she black? Yes. No. <laughs> Rachel I'm, I'm Rollins. Just saying. <laughs> Rachel Rollins. This is not no different than what they did to Craster, Larry Craster. Well, but in also, 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 uh, Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore, right. all exactly. the uh, Aramis Ayala uh, uh, in it. Florida as well. Everywhere. Two black women. Everywhere. If you say that you're not down with the program of just incarcerating black people, Roland, and putting black people in jail, if that's not your game, then they don't want you. And they will do anything to take you down. Lightfoot, 
Wake up, my sister. Your city got one of the biggest problems going on in the entire country. Think about this, Roland. The out-migration. Black folks are leaving Chicago like crazy because they don't like the fact that the administration is not responsive to right. them, no jobs, nothing going on. So they've been leaving. So that you need to make your number one priority. Eugene, I, th I just think it's just laughable. I think it's laughable, too. I think these uh, police chiefs are trash. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, FOP, we know, has been trash. I mean, that's nothing new. That's you, know, sure. you know, We've dealt with the that's trash sure. and these other trashes, FOP in Baltimore <laughs> City. Um, but you know what? I think, I'm going to tell you what I really think. I think Jesse Smollett should, you know, probably raise, you know, three or four million dollars. And over the next cycle, next two something. to four years, drop into the super PAC and target every <laughs> last one of their bosses, the mayors, the county councils, the city councils, change that entire dynamic and get all these all these trash ass <laughs> police chiefs up out of here. So you're saying hey. take it to the election. Uh, hey. at, the the day, at the end of the day, that's what this would come down move to. Right. Teresa. So I think we all on this panel represent, um, you know, a from Baltimore to where, where are you from? Oh, I'm in Maryland. I'm in with good old so, PG. Okay, and, I, and I'm ahead. in Philadelphia, and then and then the case at hand is in Chicago, right? So what is one thing they have in common? So like you said before, when you said uh, District Attorney Larry Krasner, yes. um, the relationship that him and, and the Philadelphia FOP is beyond intense. Um, the only way he is winning they right now. They threatened to hurt him. Remember? Yes, I do. They threatened to hurt and him. And so the only way he is actually winning with some of those criminal justice reforms. That that's actually working for African Americans and minorities and immigrants mm -hmm. is because of the advocacy groups around it, right? So with this new uh, pros uh, prosecutor in Chicago, yes, the factor is because your African American woman won. But when you say you are not playing ball and you are not locking up more people, that's going to put more money into their pension right. system. That's right. where the <laughs> that's where the issues happen. And so I, I really do hope that some of those local organizations, you know, we just had the National Action Network, right? They yeah. have a chapter in Chicago. I'm hoping they actually step up and step out and step for her. Well, good. Well, for, again, it should happen. Reverend Jackson and others have stood up for her as yes. well. Yeah. But again, it just shows you just how trifling uh, they are <laughs> in Chicago. <laughs> All right, let's go to Los Angeles, folks, where Eric Holder, the man charged with the fatal shooting of uh, rapper Nipsey Hussle, appeared in mm. court uh, late yesterday. He was charged with one count of murder, mm. two counts of attempted murder, and one count of possession of a firearm by a felon. Bail was set at $5 million. He's represented by Chris Darden, one of the key prosecutors in the O.J. Simpson murder trial back in 1995. Barbara, lots of people are trashing Christopher Darden, but let's just be perfectly clear. Um, and, and I know how people feel about this case, but the reality is we know girls because of our history. Mm -hmm. Every person deserves, deserves a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Whether we think somebody is guilty or not, they deserve a lawyer. You got black folks at, you got folks at Harvard right now going after this black professor because he's on the Harvey Weinstein legal team. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what, look, look, lawyers don't just represent people who we like. Yeah. Lawyers have a different role in this society. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting one uh, because, in my opinion, as a lawyer, as someone who's been practicing for decades, uh, I would say the most important thing about being a lawyer is obviously representing your clients, but you have to be really thoughtful about who you represent. Because sometimes it's about the money, mm -hmm. and it's not about the cost. And sometimes it's about people doing things that they think will get them publicity, fame, True. et cetera. But beyond the cause, Barbara. It doesn't have to be him. But beyond the cause. Yes. There still is a constitution. Yeah. Well, there's still a and, constitution and, 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 and an obligation. Yeah, yeah, but here's the deal, Barbara. Oh, but hold on, hold on, but uh, Barbara, if you got in trouble and you had to hire a lawyer, I have. Damn it, you, but you <laughs> want <laughs> right. And guess <laughs> what? <laughs> and if somebody said, "How dare you represent Barbara?" You like, have. shut up. I hired. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, they Eugene. Have. The thing is this: thing is this. there's things. a constitution, right? There's a moral, right? <laughs> One of the things about that makes our system more beautiful than most of the others in the world is that everyone has a right to an adequate defense. Mm -hmm. When you're Precisely. up against the state, you, you have a right to the best defense that you can that you can afford or can be provided to you. 
Um, and that's something that, that's, that's available to the best of these and the worst of these. Because um, sometimes what can be appeared, not in this case, but can be appeared to be the worst of these can actually be the best of these. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a moral thing. It's a, it's a, it's a it constitutional is. right. It's a moral right. Um, you know, I think, you know, cases like this, you do have lawyers jump up to do a pro bono for the publicity or whatnot. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm Eric not Holder, Are they getting quality? I'm well, not well, 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 but, 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 but okay, right, right, right. The, the Ku Klux Klan. But, but, no, 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 but, but, but you know what, you know what? But hold on, but hold on. Day, but hold on, hold on. At the end of the day. But, but wait a minute, wait a minute, hold up. Okay, Barbara said I'm not representing the Klan. Let me tell you what happened. Right. When I was, no, no, hold up. When I was um, an intern reporter with the Houston Defender, mm -hmm. this, is, this is in, um, this is in 1990. This is in 1990. There was an African-American lawyer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who represented of the KKK of in Galveston, Texas? Yes. Mm. Why? Because he, was, he was a lawyer. Later no, no, he was a lawyer with the ACLU. And he won what happened was, point. what happened was, they were trying to go after the membership role. Mm -hmm. mm. And this the this brother, he said, "Let me remind everyone." Yep. Alabama. Tell him, Roland. Yep. With Supreme Court NAACP. case, yep. Alabama went after the NAACP. And their membership roles. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he said, there are cases and there are people who others may not like me representing. He said, but I am representing this case not because he's a grand wizard with the KKK. He said, because if they come after him today, they could come after a black group tomorrow. Well, and, and, and that was the first. No, hold, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Breathe, Barbara. Oh, yeah. The point I'm making is right the there. point I'm making is when you say I never, I never, I won't rep, I won't, never represent KKK. What this guy was saying is I have to look at this beyond the KKK mm -hmm. and understand how Teresa they could go after other organizations, and that's just one of those things that people have to understand about the law. Mm -hmm. And so causes are different than the Constitution. Yes. Yep. Moral, was legal, whatever decisions you make, and yes, there are people who make decisions because of money and publicity, but there are people who say the law is the law. Teresa, and then Barbara will let you comment. Yes, thank you. Just one comment, equal representation under the law. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so as right? long as, yeah. as long but, as it's equal um, and it's quality, uh, quality representation, then Yes, it, across and to the each his own. Right, right. You, can right. you, you can decline and or people, accept. You can, and yeah. people Absolutely. have the right to criticize. Of course, they do. Mm -hmm. What they do. But the, but they the same folks on. criticizing when they got their butt in trouble, they'd be like, "Damn, I can call no, no, a big no, star." No, 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 put it this way. I wish I had an idea. Let me finish. Let me finish. Go ahead. Go. Remember in Charlottesville, in Charlottesville, the ACLU of good old Virginia stood up and argued for the right for those white supremacists to have their march yes. Yes. and to do that march. Yes. Afterwards, afterwards, the ACLU changed their policy because they made a determination that of the use of their resources and their concentration, promoting people who kill people who terrorize people was not what they should be doing. Okay. But so I just, no, 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 I just want to make it clear that I'm not, I'm not angry at the people who are angry at Chris Darden, because I think Chris made a decision, a conscious decision that I would not have made. Got it. But I think that, and I'm not against the principle that everybody's entitled to equal representation, because they are, but I'm just saying as me, as a lawyer with my values, there's certain things I don't Got it. do. The thing Final is, comment. And won't do. I'm a, I'm a libertarian at heart, right? Rights are universal. And the thing is this, once you open the door for rights to be violated, for someone's rights to be violated willingly on one end, it opens it up for the, it opens, it, it opens it up for the rights to be violated on another end down the line. I come in and I say, hey, you know, these white supremacists can't have their march, you know, walking down the street peacefully, a peaceful march. Then down the road it comes, hey, you know what, you Black Lives Matter folk aren't... We're going to no, open a violation. False it's, not, it's not a false equivalence. Bomb, yes. bomb lines right, is here. Universal. I'm going to say it again. Any of y'all watching, you can be mad at Chris Darden all you want to. But when you get your butt in trouble, you're going to hope an attorney says yes. Speaking of attorneys, seven women sued Bill Cosby, charging he defamed them when he said they were lying when they claimed Cosby sexually assaulted them. A settlement with all seven was approved by a federal judge in Massachusetts today. However, 
Cosby's official Twitter feed put this statement out late this afternoon. Mr. Cosby did not settle any cases with anyone. He is not paying anything to anyone, and he is still pursuing his counterclaims. AIG decided to settle these cases without the knowledge, permission, and or consent of Mr. Cosby. Now, let me explain what happened there. AIG was embroiled in a legal fight with Bill Cosby because Bill Cosby contended that under his homeowner's policy, AIG was responsible for any of these legal claims. This thing went all the way to the Supreme Court. They kicked it back. The courts agreed with Bill Cosby. So even though Bill Cosby, so AIG, they were the ones who could make the decision to settle this case, not Bill Cosby. And so that's really what happened there. And so AIG, they were on the hook uh, for, those, for, for those dollars. And I'm sure by settling, they said, hey, it's better to, to extend it. And so just understand that's the background there. Uh, AIG did not have to get Bill Cosby's consent because, again, he sued AIG to say, no, y'all are the ones who got to paying for this and got to fight right. this. And so the, so the point when say Bill Cosby hasn't spent any money, right, the money in this, these settlements actually comes from AIG and not Bill Cosby. That's why you pay your homeowner's insurance. All right, y'all, let's talk about Beyonce. Uh, check this out. Uh, everybody, everybody was talking today about how she signed this major deal with Adidas. Well, today on ESPN, uh, one of their reporters, Nick DePaula, he's told this interesting story that she walked out of a meeting with Reebok as a result of the lack of diversity. This is what he said. Nobody in this room, this is what he said, Beyonce said, quote, nobody in this room reflects my background, my skin color, where I'm from, and what I want to do. We don't know what, we don't know if this actually happened, but it's very easy to believe that it did happen, given the state of white privilege and Beyonce's social justice cred. Okay, y'all, I, actually, I kind of like this. I love, uh, I love yeah, it. I love it. like, okay, this is how y'all want to roll? All right. Imagine if more people did this. Well, imagine if the NBA players, imagine if the football players, imagine if people took this stance with everyone. I mean, I love that Beyonce and Jay-Z and others have gotten to the point where they can just say, hey, certain money I can turn down. I got down. leverage. I got leverage. I got standing. I got my wealth. I love it because that's what counts, that people have to take some principles. And if these companies aren't smart enough, and I say this to all those crazy law firms too, Roland, who think they can have all these rooms full of just white lawyers when black clients come in. Uh, I think this is a really important moment. Beyonce, we love you, sister. The beehive is not just, the beehive is not just brothers <laughs> and sisters. It's all of us who love you, my dear. Eugene. Yeah, I, I'm a certified member of, of the whole hive and the beehive. Um, <laughs> the thing is this, this is what happens when you have leverage that you can bring to the table. Yes. You know, she knew what she was bringing to the table. She knew that it was going to be an automatic value add for whatever company that she decided to work yes. with. Yes. And it's the ability to say no. You know, and the thing is, this, I, I agree with you. I wish a lot of folk did have the levers that, yes, that the Carters have. Yes, precisely. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a believer of, hey, you know, they're, what, they're, what, what Jay-Z and Beyonce are doing, especially in this particular time, in this particular moment, they are laying down literally a super highway for the next generation to be able to walk in and not like have that. to take the slave deals I that like a lot that. of folk have been pushed into over the last 20 years. You know, I, I wish a lot of the NBA players and NFL players could do it, but at the, at, but the mm -hmm. honesty of it is that, you know, your non-star NBA player is going to be forced to take a crappy deal because of just the way the system operates. But with what's happening in this very moment, especially in the fashion industry and the entertainment industry, with the uh, level of independence that artists are now being able to, ga being able to garner uh, and gain, people are walking in with an amount of leverage that they've never had before. They're walking in with an amount... Of, of, of negotiating uh, power that they've never had before, and it's, it's yep. a great thing. And well, it's more than that, Roland, it's also having the consciousness. Yeah. Because there have been some black athletes and others with money who did not have this level of consciousness. Yeah. And if they had done what they should have done, it would be a whole different ball. Well, again, but that's uh, that's what happens again when you uh, do have that leverage. I'm sure Reebok yes. is going, damn, we got to go hire some black people. <laughs> yeah. And look, here's the, and here's the other Thank piece. You. This is precisely Thank why. Diversify. This is precisely why those Thank of us you. at the National Association of Black Journalists have called out CNN. Yep. Yes. Because when you have no black executive producers, no black vice presidents, well. no black executive vice presidents, no black direct reports, mm. but then you say you want to represent all people. 
uh, somebody has to do it. And so CNN, they've still yet to meet with us because uh, Jeff Zucker is still mad. Saying, He's not gonna, we're not going to meet uh, if rolling the table. <laughs> well, oh, okay. oh, let, 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 me, let, me, let me just help you out, Jeff. This is very simple. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had the deadline to file uh, to run for the board directors of National Association of Black Journalists. And I'm running unopposed with VP Digital. So I ain't going nowhere for the next two years. So if y'all don't want to meet with us for two years, that's fine. But I can tell you right now, we're going to keep that pressure for y'all to hire some black people. Just let you know. And going to keep calling you out every single day. Speaking of jobs, jobs numbers came out today. 196,000 new jobs were created in March, up from a revised February number of 33,000. The overall unemployment rate stays at 3.8%, and wages growth, wage growth is up. Black unemployment uh, went down from 7.3% in February to 6.7% in March. The white unemployment rate was 3.5% a little more than half of the rate for African-Americans. And also, I just want to go ahead and uh, read you this. John Harwood sent this tweet out, and I'm going to pull up in a second. Uh, and again, you know, what you, so what you have is you have all of these people who are running around uh, talking about uh, Donald Trump and talking about um, what he has done with the economy. Hmm. And so uh, this is what... Um, uh, John Harwood tweeted, Henry, go to my iPad. Uh, GOP Rep Brady hailing job growth data today. Trump has turned the economy around after years of stagnation. Well, this is the average <laughs> monthly job yeah. growth for the last seven plus years. 2012, it was plus 181,000. 2013, plus 192,000. 2014, plus 251,000. 2015 plus 227,000, 2016 plus 193,000, and then we get to the three years of Trump. 2017 plus 179,000, 2018 plus 223,000, and 2019 plus 180,000. Now, uh, Betsy Stevenson actually uh, put this together. So what that says is, hmm, under Obama, it was... 181, 192, 251, 227, 193. Trump, first year was 179. That happens to be lower than any of the previous um, six years of Obama. 20, 2018, plus 223. Oh, that's actually lower than the two years that exceeded 200,000 under Obama. And 2019, it says... 180,000. So actually, y'all, in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in the last eight years, um, Donald Trump actually has the two lowest of the last eight years. Just for Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens and other people out there <laughs> who want to make the argument that Trump has turned the economy around it was already turned around when he showed up. You can't be standing on third base and you were a substitute runner <laughs> and then say you hit a triple. That's not how that works. All right, y'all, uh, I, I gotta deal with it. Last night, last night uh, on the show, uh, we dealt with this uh, whole issue uh, with Reverend Barbara. We were talking about, yes. we were talking about uh, folks who pimp Dr. King. Mm. And we often hear people pimping Dr. All King uh, around his birthday and, of course, uh, around the commemoration of um, his assassination. Uh, and so it didn't take long for somebody to show themselves in pimping Dr. King. Do y'all have Laura Ingram's photo? Y'all could just go ahead and put it up in, in, in the graphic because <laughs> she is the uh, latest person to uh, pimp Dr. King. So, last night, in her commentary, she had some things to say about the Democrats running for president, about the state of America, and she had some things to say about Dr. King and what he would be saying today in America. So, uh, I'm about to uh, deconstruct Laura Ingram's a two minute and 37 second commentary. Uh, and trust me, uh, I want y'all to pull out your pen and pad. I want you to pull out your iPad or your phone uh, because a uh, class is about to be in session. And so y'all go ahead and hit play. 
My friends, in an era of historically low unemployment, high home ownership, a small, you know, small business growth, off the charts, real wage growth, finally, what message do these folks offer America's voters? Stop. I'll t <laughs> the line didn't take long. Now, you heard her talk about, oh, home ownership and all of these things and how uh, they are tremendous for America. Uh, please go to my iPad. <laughs> Folks, this is the website of uh, NARAB, mm. National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, let me increase this for y'all. African-American home ownership falls to a 50-year low. Now, let me explain to you, the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, and in the history of America, the home ownership rate for black people has never exceeded, never even hit 60%. Right now, it's around 41%. Low, extreme low. But see, in Laura's two degrees from an Ivy League institution, <laughs> she says, it's just great. It's rosy. Oh, do you remember when I read those unemployment numbers? Well, they dropped last month in March. There were four consecutive months where the black unemployment rate went up. Mm -hmm. So this was the first time it has dropped yeah. in five months. We call those facts, Laura. Press play. I'll tell you what they offer. Resentment, anger, <laughs> division, and alienation. And these Democrats don't even acknowledge obvious gains, but... You know why they won't? Because to do so would affirm that Trump's policies are working. Can't have that. Now, remember, it did take a Republican president to pass criminal justice reform, uh -huh. which is already helping so many families across America. Stop! Let me explain to y'all what actually happened with the First Step Act. <laughs> First and foremost, it was initially going to be about prison reform not criminal justice reform. The person who was fighting this the most was then Attorney General Jeff Sessions. The person in the United States Senate who was fighting it the most was the one who replaced him as the biggest opponent of criminal justice reform, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. Now, some of you may ask, well, Roland, how would you know these things? <laughs> well, because in May of 2018, yours truly sat in the White House in a meeting for an hour with Jared Kushner. Mm. What you see is Jared Kushner's father was in prison. So the reality is Jared Kushner was big on the notion of prison reform. They knew they really couldn't get far because of the Republican forces who were against it. So here's what happened. You had Congressman Hakeem Jeffries from New York in the House who wanted more criminal justice reform. The bill that was actually passed in the United States House had severe limitations. You did have folks like Congressman Jim Clyburn and Congressman Cedric Richmond who voted for the bill in committee as well as when it went on the floor. Yet, when the bill went over to the Senate, you had Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat, and even Republican Chuck Grassley, who said there needs to be more in this bill and not just prison reform. Then you had Senator Cory Booker, who weighed in, Senator Kamala Harris, who weighed in. In order for it to actually go from being passed in the House to passed in the Senate, the Senate, Senate said, if y'all want Democrats votes for, Democrat votes for this, you're going to have to put more criminal justice reform into this. That's where the negotiation began to take place. Senator Tom Cotton, he wanted to simply get rid of it. You had Senator Ted Cruz, who initially was opposing it as well. But when they realized they d did not have the votes to kill it, then they, then they said, okay, you know what, we got to let it through. Now, did Donald Trump sign the First Step Act? Yes. So when Laura says it took a Republican president, no, Laura, let me help you. It took Democrat votes in the House as well as the Senate for it to even get to Donald Trump's desk. Had it been left up to Donald Trump, <laughs> it would have not been a criminal justice reform bill. It would have been a prison bill. Now, she also tried to act as if the previous president 
did nothing on criminal justice report reform. Henry, go to my iPad. This, folks, is a piece from the Washington Post. Wesley Lowry was one of those writers. First and foremost, Obama became the first sitting president to actually visit a federal prison. Depending upon how Trump keeps acting, he might be the second, but he might be a resident. Now, <laughs> if you actually read this particular piece they did, uh, one of the things that Obama did was, first and foremost, in the first thing that he um, signed, okay, Obama signed the Fair Sentencing Act. What that was was a law that was passed that reduced the disparities between powder and crack cocaine. That, that was signed into law in, t in his second year in office. In addition to that, uh, one of the things that happened was, uh, you will see the chart that they have here, one of the things that happened was, it was Attorney General Eric Holder who told prosecutors, yes. you do not have to go for the highest amount of years to put somebody in prison. Okay, that was Eric Holder. Guess what Jeff Sessions did, who Donald Trump picked to be his attorney general. <laughs> he came in and said, oh, forget what Eric Holder said. I want you to go after the highest. So here you have Donald Trump on one hand taking credit for criminal justice reform, yet his attorney general is saying, no, we're going to go after a higher sentences. Bob Barr is the replacement for Jeff Sessions. He has not rescinded any of those rules. Mm -hmm. Under Eric Holder, attorney general for Obama, he said, we are not going to use private prisons. Jeff Sessions under Trump says, we will use private prisons. Barr has not rescinded that particular decision. So just so you understand, when Republicans want to claim credit for criminal justice reform, we're talking about a small piece of criminal justice reform that was forced on them as opposed to a much more expansive and broader bill. Not only that, Donald Trump has taken credit for uh, the people who have been able to go home. Well, here's the problem with that. Henry, go to my iPad. This is a report from the Brennan Center for Justice. And they said four ways the Obama administration has advanced criminal justice reform. Number one, increase commutations. Okay. Second, create a presidential commission that then studies mass incarceration. Donald Trump hasn't even gotten close to the number of commutations of Obama. Yes, after Kim Kardashian called upon him, he let one black woman out. I think there was another black woman who he let out. But the reality is Donald Trump is not consistently every month commuting sentences of people who have been wrongfully convicted. The Brennan Center report also, Henry, back to my iPad. Number three, in federal financial subsidization of mass incarceration. $3.8 billion that went to federal uh, grants to states uh, and cities. But a lot of those were not going to work. Obama said we have to change those things. Number four, banning the box for federal employment. Those who did serve time in prison could not get themselves a job as a result of being in prison on the federal level. They banned the box. Those are the things that Obama did under criminal justice reform. See, again, Laura does not want to establish the actual facts. She wants to shade the facts. Lie. Press play. And meanwhile, the Democrats, what they basically do is offer more demonization of the police. There must be accountability for the enforcement of the law. There must be accountability for use of force. And federal funds to local police departments and sheriff's departments must be tied to accountability. But abolish ICE. Okay. Come back to me. Now, you... Now, here's the problem here. First, he didn't say abolish ICE. He said accountability of police departments. Under the Obama uh, Department of Justice, they actually were pushing those departments when it came to consent decrees in Baltimore, in Cleveland, in Chicago. Yet, under Jeff Sessions, he gave repeated speeches where he said, we're going to pull back on consent decrees because they make the cops feel bad and it hurts their morale. <laughs> and so we're not going to do that. That's what you have under Donald Trump. They, and in fact, Jeff Sessions tried to get rid of the consent decree in Baltimore that was agreed to by the police chief, agreed to by the mayor, but he said, we don't need it. The federal judge said, get the hell out of here, Elmer Fudd. 
We do need it, and it stayed in there. He fought the consent decree in Chicago, yet it was Attorney General Lisa Madigan of Illinois who said no, who sued, we are going to have a consent decree. So under Donald Trump's administration, they don't want consent decrees for police departments. They're not investigating police departments. And so Laura Ingram does not want to admit that. She does not want to admit the wrongdoing of cops across this country because, see, for her, they praise and they laud cops, yet say nothing when cops do wrong. Press play. You might not have thought that the Civil Rights Act was ever even passed more than 50 years ago. <laughs> Or that black Americans have reached the highest levels of business, the law, medicine, entertainment, sports, pretty much every area of society. Stop. And that is a now, she's praising, oh my goodness, a result of the Civil Rights Act and black people can get to do so many different things. Really, Laura? Uh, Y'all, all you had to do was type in black and wealth, white gap. Henry, go to my iPad. This is from The Economist. The black, white wealth gap is unchanged after a half century. Laura was quoting the 1964 Civil Rights Act when, if you actually read the 64 Civil Rights Act, that wasn't dealing with a bunch of the other stuff you're talking about, Laura. It was dealing with public accommodations. It was dealing with hotels. It was dealing with restaurants. Yes, black folks have always made money from singing. They simply couldn't walk through the front door of the hotels that they sold out, Laura. That's the difference. But the reality is we're still dealing with that. So, Laura, if you paint this wonderful picture of how things have been so great for black people, please explain to me how the black, go back to my iPad, how the black white wealth gap is unchained after a half century. Uh, Laura, go right ahead and read this story where they break down the Tulsa race riots. Break down where they break it down. Here they say the mean of black household wealth is 138200 For whites, it is $933,700. See, you've got to be living somewhere else if you somehow think, oh my God, everything is just so rosy for black people. See, this is why I not need y'all to understand what's happening in the world of Fox News. White people see Beyonce. White people see LeBron. White people see Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union, and they see Oprah, and they see Tiger, and they say, oh, my God, those blacks, they have just got it made. <laughs> Yet, they say nothing with no black executives at CNN. They say nothing with fewer black law, law partners and major law firms in America today than it was 10 years ago. Right. A lower number of black Fortune 500 CEOs today than we had a decade ago. See, for them, look, y'all got y'all black president. Everything was wonderful. What is wrong with y'all complaining? Press play. Very good thing. Watching and listening to this Democrat field kowtow to Al Sharpton makes it seem like America didn't even elect and then reelect its first black president. But for the hardcore racial rabble rousers, Obama's victories, remember, they were just baby steps. What they want now is full on income confiscation meant to enforce equal outcomes, if not equal opportunity. We're in the post Obama generation. So we have already seen a black president. We've already seen uh, a black first family. Now we want to know what it is going to mean. Symbolism is not enough now. It's substance. substance wow. And if there's no substance, then uh, we, we've gotten over the aura of the first. Wow, pretty dismissive of Obama there. Today is the anniversary of the assassination of Stop the Reverend right Martin there. Luther King. Stop right there. I'm going to pick that one up in a second. But they spoke, so she said, oh, dismissive. No, it's not dismissive. It's facts. Laura, did criminal justice in America somehow change overnight because Thurgood Marshall became the first African-American Supreme Court justice? The answer is no. Did Virginia lose all of its racism and all of its past when Doug Wilder became the first black governor of Virginia? The answer is no. Did Massachusetts somehow heal its racial divide because Deval Patrick became the first black governor of Massachusetts? No. Did Cleveland change because Stokes became the first black 
black mayor, Hatcher in uh, Gary, Indiana, Maynard Jackson in Atlanta, uh, Kurt Schmoke uh, in Baltimore, Rice. I mean, we can go down. Black mayors in Baltimore and Seattle and Los Angeles, in Houston and all across this country. And the reality is we still are electing first black mayors across this nation. Laura, seriously, two Ivy League degrees? What the hell were you doing in history class? What were you doing in sociology class? What were you doing at all? Were you reading, were you studying, or were you studying history and not actual history? Now she gets to Dr. King. So let me bring this thing home. Press play. Anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. I was thinking, like, if he were alive today, I wonder what he'd think about such dismissive comments and about a Democrat party that believes it can regain power by living in a constant state of protest or racial hatred and denial. And that's the angle. Oh, Laura, by all means, let me take you to April 3rd, 1968, when Dr. King gave his speech, the mountaintop speech. Let me help you out. Here's a book for you to read. Called, uh, it's called Martin Luther King's Biblical Epic, his final great speech by Keith D. Miller. See, in that particular, particular speech, you mentioned what would Dr. King have to say about Democrats in a perpetual state of protest. Uh, in that speech, he was talking about protest. He was talking about uh, fighting a particular system. He was talking about what we must do. Oh, Henry, please go to my iPad. Here is Dr. King saying, now we're going to march again. And we've got to march again in order to put the issue where it's supposed to be and force everybody to see that there are 1,300 of God's children here suffering, sometimes going hungry, going through dark and dreary nights, wondering how this thing is going to come out. That's the issue. Then he said, we aren't going to let any may stop us. We are masters of, in our nonviolent movement in disarming police forces. That's what he said. Then he goes later uh, in the speech. He also says, commend the preachers and what they're involved. Then he says, Laura, now the other thing we'll have to do is this. Always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. That's what he said. Now, come on back. Now, here's the other piece. Y'all, Laura started her, com her com commentary by saying, Democrats, they want to sit here and take money. Then she quotes King. Do, do, let me help y'all out. Here's a book called The Guaranteed Income. This book is edited by Robert Theobald. This is the book where Dr. King got his perspective on the guaranteed income. Here is another book written by Dr. King. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? In this book, Dr. King said, we need a guaranteed income in America. In this book, Dr. King talked about the check being stamped insufficient funds. In this book, Dr. King talked about what is required of America, because he said that America, frankly, had not done enough. It didn't cost much. In fact, Laura, let me actually quote Dr. King. Quote, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. The limited reforms have been obtained at bargain rates. There are no expenses and no taxes are required for Negroes to share lunch counters, libraries, parks, hotels, and other facilities with whites. Even the psychological adjustment is far more formidable. Having exaggerated the emotional difficulties for decades when demands for new conduct became inescapable, white Southerners may have trembled under the strain, but they, but they did not collapse. See, earlier in your commentary, you actually said the people act like the Civil Rights Act didn't happen. This book was written in 1967, three years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, two years after the Voting Rights, Voting Rights Act of 1965. King is talking about it did not cost America much. So, Laura, what exactly are you talking about? King lays out in this particular book where he said the real cost lies ahead. The stiffening of white resistance is a recognition of that fact. Hmm. This is the same king who you just quoted. And in fact, when you quoted that same king, you then said exactly what it is he would say about today. Same king 
A good many observers have remarked that if equality could come at once, the Negro would not be ready for it. I submit that the white American is even more unprepared. Lord, see, that's the king. See, if you're going to quote the king, then I say you quote the king. Don't ask what would king say today about what is happening with Democrats and Republicans. What you should do is go to the text and see what king actually said about these very issues. Because here he was in 1967 writing about the very issues of income inequality, writing about the millions being spent on war, on Vietnam War, writing about the lack of strong poverty programs. The same conversations that we're having today in 2019, Laura, King was talking about in 1967 and when he was killed in 1968. Let me also remind you that when he was killed April 4th, 1968, he was playing the Poor People's Campaign here is what King had to say about income and wealth in America, and this was posted last night by his daughter, Reverend Bernice King. Laura. Through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. To get our check. This is what King also wrote. The American racial revolution has been a revolution to get in rather to, than to overthrow. We want to share in the American economy, the housing market, the educational system, and the social opportunities. This goal itself indicates that a social change in America must be nonviolent. If one is in search of a better job, it has not helped to burn down the factory. If one needs more adequate education, shooting the principal will not help. If housing is the goal, only building and construction will produce that end. To destroy anything personal property cannot bring us closer to the goal that we seek. Laura, he was talking about the riots in 1967, which the Kerner Commission report broke down where they said there were two Americas, one white, one black. See, this is real simple, Laura. There's a reason why you're not going to invite this black man on your show. Because, see, unlike you, Keith Miller's book, I've read it. Where do we go from here? I've read it. King's book, Strength to Love, I read it. Why We Can't Wait, I read it. The Guaranteed Income, I read it. So when I go on, I'm not talking about King in some uh, interesting, weird sort of way, throwing out a question. I'm going to present you undeniable facts based upon what he said and what he preached. See, the problem is, folks like you, Laura, with your two Ivy League degrees, somehow skipped over all these texts. I might be a Texas A&M graduate, may not be an Ivy League school, but I have the ability to actually read these books and others. But the problem is you want to present this very nice, wonderful, rosy white view of who King is because what y'all want is for MLK to be that civil rights mascot that's a bobblehead who you put on the, on the shelf and break out twice a year and go, that's Dr. King, nice and wonderful, and he was all about love when in fact he was a radical. Theobald book, The Guaranteed Income, he lays it out. He said it's about the economic distribution in this country. So yes, Laura, you're absolutely right. When you say Democrats are talking about a redistribution of wealth in America away from the haves to the have-nots, that is exactly what King was talking about in 1963 at the March in Washington and in 64 when he was in Birmingham, and in 65 when he was in Selma, and in 66 when he was in Chicago, and in 67 on April 4th, 1967 when he gave the Beyond, Beyond Vietnam speech in Riverside, and when he went to Memphis to stand with sanitation workers. 
If you want to quote King, damn it, you better quote the real King, not the fake King like Elvis Presley, uh, the, the King of Rock and Roll. You better quote Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the one who was at 16 with the Morehouse, the one who was raised by his mama and daddy, the one who went to Boston, the one who was in Montgomery. You better quote the King that we know and not the Joker that y'all have somehow presented. Laura, you may have spent all those years getting an Ivy League education. I dare say you got more in this education in the past 15 minutes than you ever gotten with those two Ivy League degrees. You should ask for your money back. Going to a break. I'll be back. I'm Roland Martin on the filter in just a moment. Non-voting is a fruitless temper tantrum. Judge Bruce Wright. All right, folks, HBCU Giving Day. Uh, University of Simmons College. Of course, uh, that's uh, simmonscollege.ky.edu. Uh, that is, of course, the... Uh, uh, university we're supporting. If you want to support them, please go to that website uh, and give to support all that they do. Uh, I want to right now go to uh, get a um, final comment. Actually, uh, I think we have the HPC Mobility Challenge. Let me go ahead and do that first before I get a final comment from our panel before we then play the rest of these remembrances. Calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCUs communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will receive a grant of up to 25000 bucks to implement their proposal. The deadline to apply has been extended to April 15th, 2019. Go to this website, fgb.life, for more information and to apply. Ford goes further in our community. Final thoughts, uh, been a crazy busy week. Uh, final thoughts from Barbara and Eugene, whatever you want, go ahead. Well, first of all, on Laura Ingram, I think people need to understand that King's last speech, the one we didn't get to hear, the one he was going to give that night that he was assassinated was titled, America is going to hell. That was the title of the speech. It's a speech that we need to know more about, that we need to. Also, people need to look at his speech that he gave at Stanford University in 1967, where he talks about his economic agenda. And it's a powerful speech. It's one that I would recommend that everybody know. In the course of all the things that are going on right now, the fight in Florida to hold that legislature right. accountable right. on Amendment 4, everybody get involved in that. Iowa, you dropped the ball. Got it. Your Senate, so we need to fight for Florida. Eugene. Restoration. Uh, I think the week has come full circle. We started the week with, uh, you know, the tragic death of Nipsey Hussle, who, you know, was a business owner, an entrepreneur, an activist that also just happened mm -hmm. to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. um, and here we're ending it with, you know, celebrating, you know, Beyonce and the leverage that she was able to put on display, but more importantly, um, emphasizing it with the legacy of Dr. King yes. and where we are as a people today. Um, you know, you know, folk like Fox News and some of the other media uh, networks, they, they bastardized, you know, Dr. King's legacy. Uh, to, you know, be in a meek, mild manner, you know, <laughs> leader that just wanted, you know, harmony among people, when in reality, it was an economic fight above everything. Yep. Oh. And so, you know, I think our week has come full circle and it's beautiful. All right, folks. Uh, one of the reasons we want you to support Roller Martin Unfiltered is because of the interviews that we have done uh, commemorating the life of Dr. King. And so we're going to end the show this week, end this week, uh, with these uh, interviews. Yesterday, of course, was April 4th, uh, the 51st anniversary of his assassination. Uh, we did not play all of those because we had a number to play. Then there's a known Clayton interview. If you missed that powerful show yesterday, you need to go to YouTube and check it out. Uh, we're going to hear today uh, from Bill Lucy, Juanita Abernathy, the widow of Ralph Abernathy, Reverend Dr. King's best friend. El Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, Andrew Young, Reverend Dr. James Lawson, who, who Reverend Dr. Dr. King uh, quoted in that April 3rd, 68 speech. Also, Car Car Carson Claiborne, uh, who, of course, uh, runs the King Institute out at Stanford University. Dorothy Cotton, the only woman who was in the inner circle 
<laughs> of Dr. King and also his son, Martin Luther King III. Uh, and so we're going to end the show with that, and then we're going to end the show with all of our donors, mm -hmm. Roland Martin Unfiltered. I see uh, the folks who have given to us on YouTube. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to try to get to their names real quick. Uh, thank you so much, Duncan Sawyer, for your donation. Let me, uh, Latoya uh, Abstract, thank you for your donation as well. Let me also, I think I missed somebody. Uh, and um, let's see, uh, Tavia Cleveland, uh, thank you uh, very much as well. If you want to support what we do, because again, what you just heard me break out with Laura Ingram, you ain't going to hear that on CNN or MSNBC or anywhere else. This is why we must have our own shows, our own platforms to speak our issues. So we want you to support Roland Martin Unfiltered by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You can give via Cash App, PayPal, or uh, Square. Uh, no matter what, uh, you can give, uh, no matter what amount you give. Uh, folks have given two bucks. Folks have given fifty, a hundred, five hundred, a thousand. Uh, and so we want you to support what we do. Uh, I would love for us by the end of this weekend to have two hundred and fifty new members to add to the video. We're going to play after these King interviews, uh, just so you know that. Also. I'm going to be gone all next week. We leave for the Tom Jordan Morning Show cruise on yeah. Sunday. Uh, and so I'll be doing interviews on that. i got work to do on the cruise. Uh, but we're going to have a, a, all of our familiar faces who will be guest hosting the show. And so we want all of you to still tune in uh, next week. And so, again, please support this show to make this thing possible. We must be able to support our own and fund our own freedom. And so we want to end it in the appropriate way. Hear more voices. who are talking about April 4, 68, what they were doing, how they felt, but also how they carried forth, because today being April 5th, folks, the day after, not only that, that night, King was dead yes. three hours. Mm -hmm. They were already planning what was next. They said, we got to keep going, and we do the same thing now. Y'all have a great weekend. That was the most traumatic incident in my life ever, losing a father publicly, along with the world. I mean, I, we saw it on television. I mean, in other words, I was sitting in our dining, in our uh, family room. We were all, all of us, I think all four of us. And it was flashed across the screen. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has just been shot. We rushed back to mom's room to get some understanding. Well, what happened? And mom was preparing to go because she had received a call, go to Memphis, from Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson. And so she actually was preparing to go. She got to the airport and the mayor of the city was walking toward her and she could tell that the way he was walking was, there was not gonna be good news. And he said to him, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. King, Dr. King did, did not survive. So she came back home to comfort us, the four of us, and explained to us, in these words I remember, your father is gone home to live with God. I don't remember her saying he was assassinated. She never used that harsh language. He's gone home to live with God. You'll see him. But when you see him, he will not be able to hug and kiss you as he often did. But one day, you'll see him again. That was sufficient for me. But my siblings continued, many, the older ones, Jolanda and Dexter, continued to ask questions. I accepted what mom said for the time being, although I was just kind of in a, in a daze. I mean, it was like, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to? I'm gonna make it out there. There was some staff down on the on the ground, and Raph, they were, Raph was putting aftershave, Aramis aftershave on, when he heard what he said sounded like a firecracker, and then he looked down, and saw the soles of modern shoes, and he ran outside, and uh, the staff was coming up crying and all carrying on. And he said, stop acting like sissies. Call the ambulance. Call the ambulance. You don't have time to cry. Call the ambulance. And he called the ambulance. And when they got there, the ambulance came. And um, they got in. Ralph got in. And took him on, took Martin on to the hospital. And Ralph <clears throat> said to Martin, he grabbed his head. He said, Ralph, Martin, this is Ralph. This is Ralph. This is Ralph. And he grabbed him up and held him. And he said, Martin whispered to him, please, Ralph, take my people forward. And Ralph said, Oh, Martin, oh, Martin, oh, Martin. 
And he never said another word. As much as we had learned of his, of his encounters with danger, I have to tell you, Roland, assassination, I was not prepared for. I was young and married and just and had my first child. And, and uh, you know, for me, the civil rights movement would go on to some version of it forever. Yes, I knew King was in danger. Uh, and yes, Malcolm X had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. What I did not understand is that I was in the decade of assassinations, where when people disagreed with you, they would kill you. In the evening, I, I lose track of the time, but the word came over the radio uh, that Dr. King had been shot on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel. And uh, among all the unbelievable things that you just refused to accept, uh, this was one of them. So, so, so you hear this on the radio. So a co-staffer and myself, we were like five minutes from the Lorraine Motel. Uh, we jump in the car and we come around here. And by the time we get here, uh, police were already here, uh, keeping people out uh, as, as opposed to keeping people in. And uh, the, 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 this whole evening uh, was just one that we had difficulty believing. Um, Dr. King, as, as prominent a leader as he was, uh, to be shot on the balcony made no sense to us at all. Uh, it was not like he was a stranger in town. He should have and perhaps did have as much security as you could have. Uh, but the, the, the evening ended uh, with not only with the shooting, but with him being taken to the hospital. Uh, our responsibility then was to make sure that nobody else was injured. I mean, the city obviously was just outraged and... Uh, our job was to make sure that the people, A, uh, got home all right, uh, didn't confront uh, the police or anybody else with any, any activities that would cause there to be more harm. Uh, and then to reconvene a meeting of all the partners in this thing to talk about where do we go from here. You get word that he's died. Where are you? And how do you react? Um, well, you know, personally, you know, it was an incredible level of sadness. Uh, uh, it was not like you had a leader who preached violence. Uh, you had probably one of the most committed men to nonviolence, yet to be killed as a violent act. Um, we we were a little. Uh, we had to think through what this all meant. Uh, how and what do we do with the men the next day? Uh, how do we handle the notification across the country uh, as to what was taking place in Memphis? And at least whatever advice we were going to give to other folks, uh, how they should react. And uh, clearly, uh, the, the country was beginning to go up in smoke. Uh, you know, the anger... Uh, that was across their major urban areas mm -hmm. was just incredible. The closeness, I think, is what a lot of people don't really understand. How close all of you were. We, it was, it was too late to do anything different. We were close. Do you still miss them? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Probably always will. We were friends, but we could throw balls at each other. And then Martin were chasing each other around a bed one night, and uh, and Andy was running around the bed and laughing. <laughs> but it was it was also fun. It was, um, it was that were you, what, what do you do? And cause we didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, if we had known, you know, somebody was going to take him out, <laughs> we probably would have got off that porch. 
<laughs> but you can't predict all that's going to happen. At least you might. <laughs> we couldn't predict everything that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. We gathered as soon as we got back, to, and we said, look, you can kill the dreamer, but you've got to keep the dream alive. So everybody decided that we were going to continue doing what he had laid out for us to do. You cannot let death turn you around. And you had to, we had to kind of use what he left us. And President Johnson did do that, and we got the Great Society and Medicare, Medicare, and 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 um, a lot of the poor people's dream was fulfilled in that Great Society bill that Lyndon Johnson introduced after his death. We should commemorate. You know, a great leader died 50 years ago, and. And what we're doing here on, on the Stanford campus is we're going to commemorate the mountaintop speech on April 3rd. But after April 4th, what I want to see is what's going to happen with the legacy. Not just of King, but of the movement that he symbolized. You know, if, if we have a commitment to answer his question, where do we go from here? then I think we've done something useful. If it's simply about April 4th, then James Earl Ray wins, because that's what it's going to be all about. It's just, you know, how, how did he get assassinated? But we need to find some way. And now, look, look right here at this institute, these, these papers, these should be on every cell phone. You know, you've got Apple computer that makes more money than, you know, almost a trillion dollars. Why couldn't, why couldn't all of this just be downloaded for free so that everybody would have access to this, this legacy, this wonderful legacy that's part of American history? And I think that we can start doing that in terms of actually learning you know, he was a visionary. We need to understand what was that vision? Because he envisioned a better America. He envisioned an, an America that transcended these divisions of race and class and religion and all these sorts of things that are tearing apart other countries.
You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Bart Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Bart Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Bart Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>